is a little song that I'm familiar with. Oh. A little town of Bethlehem, how still we see the light of a deep and dreamless sleep. The silent star go by, yet in thy dark streets shining, the everlasting light the hopes and fears of all these years are met in thee tonight for christ is born of mary and gathered all about why mortals sleep angels they watch a wandering night, a morning star together, proclaim thy holy birth, and praises sing to God the King, the peace of men on earth. O little town of Bethlehem, I still we see thy light above thy deep dreamless sleep. The silent star go by, yet in thy dark streets shine the everlasting light. The hopes and tears of all these years are met in thee. So, and then it's straight, that one is the uh, probably the only song we could manage uh, for the Christmas season, which is Mary, did you know? Uh, well, it's a contrast to the previous one, really great, great one. And let us think what this could be. It's really interesting thoughts in it. Our sons and daughters, did you know that your baby boy has come to make you new? This child that you deliver will soon deliver you. Mary, did you know your baby boy will give the sign to blind men? Mary, did you know? Your baby boy will calm the storm with his hand. Did you know that your baby boy has walked the angels' trot? When you kiss your little baby, then you kiss the face of God. Mary, did you know? Something special. People can talk about the advent 
of the internet, for instance. It means the arrival of the internet. It can also refer to the advent of a person. And of course, that is what we think about as Christians, is the arrival of Jesus. And today, as we think about the preparation, as we had that lighting of the Bethlehem candle, we turn once more to Isaiah. Now, Isaiah is a remarkable book in the Old Testament. There's a man named Dr. H.L. Wilmington. Dr. Wilmington is the founder and dean of a Bible school. He's the founder and dean of a Bible institute. He's a professor at a theological seminary. He refers to Isaiah as the Shakespeare of the Old Testament. And he does that for good reason. Isaiah has such rich, beautiful language. He has such an amazing vocabulary. In fact, Isaiah is so special that other than the book of Psalms, when it comes to the New Testament, there are more quotes from the book of Isaiah than any other book except for the book of Psalms. Isaiah, according to Dr. Wilmington, also has probably the most important and far-reaching chapter in the entire Old Testament. Oh, okay. Did that catch you off guard? I would not have made that kind of a statement, but this is what Dr. Wilmington says, and he backs it up with good reason. He says that Isaiah chapter 53 is perhaps the most important and far-reaching chapter in the entire Old Testament. He says that this one chapter, Isaiah 53, is quoted from or is alluded to 85 times in the New Testament. Jesus himself in John chapter 12, verse 41, says that Isaiah saw his glory, the glory of Jesus, and that Isaiah in his writings spoke about Jesus Christ. So as we looked last week from Isaiah, and today, as we continue to look at Isaiah, the theme of preparation, if you have your own copy of Scripture, please find chapter 40 of Isaiah. In chapter 40 of Isaiah, if you have your own copy of Scripture, let's look at verses 1 and 2 to give us some background for the verses that we will focus on today. Isaiah chapter 4, looking at verses 1 and 2. The Bible says, comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. What is the context of these verses, verses 1 through 2? What is the comfort that Isaiah is talking about? Well, many, many years have passed. Last week, we looked at Isaiah chapter 9 and the prophecies that were given. But looking in general at Isaiah, again, if you have your own copy of Scripture, if you look at Isaiah chapter 1, the very first verse, Isaiah tells us that he's writing about events that took place under the rule of King Uzziah, King Jotham, King Ahaz, and King Hezekiah. And if you have a piece of paper, I think it's very helpful to write yourself a few notes. Because you see, as Isaiah is writing, he's writing from his perspective about things that were happening during the reign of these four different kings. But to get more important information about those four kings, please write yourself a few notes. The first king is Uzziah. Uzziah was 16 years old when he started to rule as a king. He ruled for 52 years. He did what was right in the Lord's eyes, and he had one of the, quote, most successful kingdoms written about in the Old Testament. Now, you won't find all of those details simply in the book of Isaiah, but if you go to 2 Chronicles 
chapter 26. Please write down that note for yourself. Second Chronicles chapter 26. You will see that the Bible declares that Isaiah did what was right. And therefore, one of the most successful times in the history of Jerusalem and Judea was under the reign of Isaiah. Sadly, Isaiah was not a perfect man. He had sin in his life of pride. And, I, and in 2 Chronicles chapter 16, we can also read about that. Now, going on to his son, Jotham. Jotham was 25 years old when he began to reign. He reigned for 16 years. And just like his father, Isaiah, Jotham also did what was right. And there was a good season of history for the people of Israel. We don't read anything, though, about that in Isaiah. So we need to go to 2 Chronicles chapter 27. If you look at 2 Chronicles chapter 27, you will see the many good things that Jotham did. Now, the next person, Ahaz, he was 20 years old when he began to reign. And last week in Isaiah's chapter 7, 8, and 9, we saw a few things about, about this man Ahaz. In contrast to Isaiah, in contrast to Jotham, sadly, 2 Chronicles chapter 28, it tells us that Ahaz did what was evil. And there were terrible consequences to pay for that. Now, it's interesting what Ahaz did that was, quote, evil. On one hand, he reacted in a bad way to reasonable fear. There were oppositions to his kingdom. But even though God tried to speak to Ahaz to be quiet, to be calm, we can read about that in Isaiah chapter 7. Ahaz doesn't follow those instructions from God. In fact, he goes completely against what God tells him to do. Now, sadly, not only does he react badly to fear that we would understand. If we heard that there was an opposing army coming against us, we could understand that. But worse than that, Ahaz not only doesn't listen to God, he begins to adopt the practices of the pagan nations, and he brings those practices back to Jerusalem itself and because of these sinful actions, the people are taken away into captivity. We can read about Ahaz in 2 Chronicles 28, more details. And then he is followed, and here is the intersection of our story today. He is followed by Hezekiah. Hezekiah, who is 25 years old, he reigns for 29 years and he, praise the Lord, is once more a ruler that did what was right. So in 2 Chronicles chapter 29, chapter 30, chapter 31, chapter 32, we can read the details of what Hezekiah did as he faithfully followed the Lord. Sadly, as was true of Isaiah, Hezekiah also came to a point of pride in his life, and there was also a time of punishment that he experienced. Now, with all of that background, as we read those two simple verses, we acknowledge that fear and stress is normal. And there are many top 10 lists that we can find. We can do an internet search. What are the top 10 lists of modern times of fear? And there's many different, many different things that come up, even in our modern times. Two of the greatest fears are death and failure. Around the world, in different cultures, in different contexts, those tend to be two of the greatest fears, and a common fear is also related to that, a loss of control. Going back to what we saw last week, Ahaz was facing a situation that on one hand was understandable. 
There were, there were the words that opposition was coming against him. And we saw last week that our true source of hope must always be placed in God. Yes, we take reasonable actions, but sadly, when Ahaz was facing stressful times, instead of putting his hope and retaining his hope in the Lord, he put his hope in other places. And as he put his hope in other places, it also led to sin in his life, and that sin created terrible consequences. And we understand that that, that happens even today. There's two great lessons for us as we look at Ahaz that is good for us to remember. One about fear and one about sin. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, the Bible tells us that God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. And in 1 John chapter 4, verse 18, the Bible tells us there is no fear in love, but in perfect love cast out fear. Fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. So we will face stressful situations in our life. And fear might be, on one hand, a natural reaction. It can be a prompt for us to remind us, however, that we don't just react in sinful ways that we must continue to do what is prudent, to do what is wise. We've talked about this throughout these entire times of pandemic, but not to be carried away, to have an undue stress, to have an undue fear. God is our hope, and we need to rely upon him as we take prudent, faithful actions. Sadly, in the life of Ahaz, we also see demonstrated the consequences of sin. And there's a good reminder uh, from a friend of mine who, who had this statement. And I think about what my friend said many, many times, and I know that it is absolutely true. A friend of mine used to make this statement, sin always takes you farther than you want to go. And sin always keeps you longer than you want to stay. And in the life of Ahaz, we see the reality of that. Because of his sin and because of the impact that it had on the entire nation, it took them farther away than they ever wanted to go. And it kept them in bondage longer than they ever wanted to stay. And in fact, as we look at the history of the children of Israel, some people, even to this day, they know about, quote, the 10 lost tribes. And they're called the 10 lost tribes because they went into the Assyrian captivity, and these tribes never repented. They never repented of their sins. They never turned back to the one true God. And so therefore, Reuben, Simon, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, Asher, Issachar, Zebulun, Manasseh, Ephraim, those 10 tribes are referred to as the 10 lost tribes of Israel because as they were taken away into captivity, there is never any written word that they repented and turned and came back to the Lord. Only Judah and Benjamin. But praise the Lord, Judah and Benjamin, there is a time of their repenting and coming back to the Lord. As we look at those first two verses today in Isaiah chapter 40, this is the comfort that is being prophetically proclaimed. Comfort, comfort, my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. There are these tender words in Isaiah chapter 40, verses 1 through 2. Many, many years have passed. But prophetically, Isaiah is declaring that the 
internal warfare is ended. The internal sins of the people are pardoned. The discipline has been administered. Therefore, we move into these verses today of Isaiah chapter 40, verses 3 through 5, and we think today about preparation. The Lord's word declares to us in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, if you have a copy of your own scriptures, a voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. 154 times in the Bible, the word preparation. Now, I'm using the English Standard Version. In different versions, of course, there are different words of translations, but more than 150 times in the Bible, using the English Standard Version, there is a reference to the word preparation. In fact, we think about God and his actions. In Genesis, the first three chapters, as God created the world, as everything was good, unfortunately, in Genesis chapter 3, as Adam and Eve fell into sin, even, even from the beginning of all eternity, there is a prophecy about Jesus Christ that is in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. And if we go to John chapter 1, we are told that in the beginning was the Word, and that is referring specifically to Jesus Christ. We know that God made preparations for the children of Israel when they were wandering in the wilderness. He told them about keeping the Sabbath holy. He also told them about, not told them, he also provided manna for them. But then there was a bit of a dilemma. Okay, if we are supposed to keep the Sabbath holy, but we are not supposed to do any work on the Sabbath, what do we do about, about food on the Sabbath? And we see in Exodus chapter 16, verse 5, how God says, the day before the Sabbath, you're going to have a double portion of manna. And so we see time and time again that God is preparing for his children, preparing far in advance. God is not taken by surprise. God knows the beginning. He knows the ending. He is the alpha. He is the omega. And so God makes preparations for us. God knew us before we were ever born. And in fact, God says that he has plans for us and they are good for us. We need to make our own preparations though, and we need to be obedient to God. In Matthew chapter 25, we see both of those concepts combined. If you're, again, writing notes for yourself, look at Matthew chapter 25, and we can see the combination of being prepared and obeying God. Matthew chapter 25, verse 1, begins with a parable about, quote, the ten virgins. Some of them are prepared, and some are unprepared. It goes on in Matthew chapter 25 to verse 14 to talk about the parable of the talents, people that are giving opportunities to serve. Some use those opportunities wisely and some don't. And ultimately, in chapter 25, verse 31, we read about the final judgment. When those people who made preparations, who obeyed God, receive their final judgment. And so today, as we look at these verses, we see the prophetic declaration to make preparations. <laughs> Pause for just a moment. Make, make preparations though, where? In the desert, in a hard time, 
It's been a time of suffering. It's been a time when people have experienced the consequences of fear and sin. And yet God's comfort and God's hope comes to his people and he tells them to make preparations in the desert. And why? Because the glory of the Lord is appearing and you don't want to miss that during this time of Advent celebrations for us. What are we preparing? How are we preparing? Perhaps we're not facing warfare. Perhaps we're not facing a deportation into exile as the children were facing in those chapters from Isaiah chapter 9 all the way up until Isaiah chapter 40. Perhaps it's not identically the same, but the principles are still there. I don't want to, over, to overstate the pandemic, but, but the reality is that around the world, people are under stress. And when we are under stress, we are all finding ways to cope. And we are all tempted when we are under stress to take too much control into our own hands. We need some sense of order. We need some sense of balance. And even we need to remind ourselves that during this time of stress, there is still times of, there is still the prophetic word of comfort and hope that we need to turn to Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. We need to follow him in obedience. As these people were told to make preparations in the midst of a wilderness because the glory of God was going to be revealed, how are we preparing in our hearts? We prepare in all different areas of our lives. We prepare for meals. We prepare for big meetings. We prepare for tests and exams that we have in school. We, we prepare all kinds of, of different things in our lives. And at a minimum, when we are preparing, there tend to be two things that take, that take place. On one hand, as we are preparing, there are things to clean out. Very often, for instance, if we're going to prepare a meal in the kitchen, the first thing that we need to do is we need to make the kitchen clean so that we can have access to all of the utensils, so that we can have access to the plates and the bowls and the spoons and what we need to have. And, and symbolically, there are times in our life that there are things that we need to clean out. We need to turn. We need to repent from sin in our lives. But not only do we need to do those things, again, returning to the analogy of, of preparing a big meal, we need to stock up that kitchen. We need to put food in that kitchen. We need to put flour. We need to put spices. We need to have water. We need to have other kinds of flesh. There are things that we need to put in place as we are making preparations. Again, symbolically, as we think about our lives, some people put such an emphasis on avoiding sin. Hear me clearly. We do need to avoid sin. But if we focus so much on the, quote, sin that we're not doing or that we're avoiding, we can miss the fact that Jesus Christ calls us to be obedient, that he calls us to follow him. And you know, if I make it my, if I make it my goal in life that I am going to follow Jesus, if I do that, if that is my goal, then of course I'm going to avoid sin. On the contrast, if my only goal is to avoid sin, ironically, it doesn't necessarily mean that I'll ever progress in following Jesus. So as we think about preparation today in our own lives, what are we doing? Are we only trying to avoid sin? Or in fact, are we trying to pursue godliness? That's a question for each one of us to consider this year. In the midst of the beautiful preparations, in the midst of the Advent wreaths, in the midst of the Christmas trees, in the midst of the family meals, in the midst of the meetings that we'll have, 
that we want to have, that we should have in the midst of preparations for all of these times of celebration, how are we preparing our hearts to follow Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior? Some personal questions for you to answer, for me to answer, for each of us to answer in our own lives. This coming week, what is one practical thing that would prepare your heart to be more like Jesus? What do you want to do this week? These people were told, prepare, prepare a way in the desert, in our own hearts. What is one practical thing for me to do this week that would help me to be more like Jesus? What is an act of obedience that I need to take this week so that I would be following Jesus more clearly like I need to do? You know, if I follow Jesus, if that is my goal, to follow Jesus during this time of the Advent season, it will draw me to place my hope upon God. It will draw me to have preparation in my heart. It will draw me in a positive way forward to do what I need to do. This time of celebration is a great time of reflection. May each of us make preparations, not merely in the decorations of our homes, but in the inner nature of our heart. May we each make preparations for the coming glory of the Lord. The mic is on. And uh, that was a deep message to say a lot. And uh, let, it, let, it, let it all hills come down. Let us all valley fill in. That is really reflects, reflects how we should not be too high or too down, you know, in order to see what God is doing. And everyone will see that God's salvation. So that song has the, uh, has the one verse which is really related to the Christmas, so that I thought of that to sing. Let's do it. Cannot compare to the glory of your love. There is no shadow in your presence. No more the man would dare to stand before your throne, before the Holy One of Heaven. And it's only by your blood. And it's only through your mercy, Lord, I come. I pray that offering was you to my King. No one on earth deserves the praises that I sing. Jesus may receive the honor that you do. Yeah. 
that I sing. Jesus, may you receive the honor that you love you. All honor and honor that you love Offering and offering of worship to my King. No one on earth deserves this praises that I sing. Jesus, may you receive the honor that you're due. All that I bring an offering to you. All I bring an offering to you. Thank you. 